Hi, this is my review of the Ambrosia Manual. Some time ago, about a year ago, I reviewed the Ambrosia Quick Start. If you haven't seen my review of the Quick Start, I recommend that you do so. Although that is not necessary to understand the content of this review of the Ambrosia Manual, because this is a complete rule set with the campaign world. But still, if you want to check out the review of the Quick Start, I'm going to put the link in the description below. So what is Ambrosia? Ambrosia is a dark fantasy game based on the, or rather inspired by the folklore and the history of the Low Countries of Europe. This role-playing game is a bit more on the storytelling side of things. This game puts great emphasis in character development and the history of the campaign world, but also how the story, the personal story of each of the characters intertwines with any chronicle that you are telling. Now, let's talk about the quality of the PDF. There are a couple of criticisms that I have when it comes to the quality. First of all, there are no bookmarks and no hyperlinks. And this makes it really difficult to navigate the entire PDF because this is quite big, it's 270 pages. So it's not going to be easy to run this from your computer and you're at the table and trying to find the right section for the rules or some uh, story content. It's not going to be easy. And the book is well organized and written. You even have an index. So adding hyperlinks and bookmarks would make it a lot better, at the very least bookmarks. So I hope that would be added in the future. And there are a few typos throughout the book. They weren't anything major, they didn't make it difficult to understand the content and the game world, but they are there. So those are my only criticisms when it comes to equality. But everything else is awesome. I like the organization a lot. This book starts giving you information of the game world and also the system, the rules. And I think this is crucial before you create a character, because you need to understand the situation, because this is not a standard fantasy role-playing game. It looks like that, but uh, by the end of this review, I will try to communicate how this uh, book feels, or what it feels like. And I consider the graphic design to be very neat, very clean. You can read the entire book and your eyes won't get tired. It's one of those books that you suddenly read like 10 or 20 pages and you thought that it was just a few seconds. I also like the photo montages or photo manipulations throughout the entire book. A few of them have a bit too much of a, let's say, medieval or maybe even Renaissance fair feel to them. That You see people that they feel a bit like they are in costumes, but for the most part, the photos really get you immersed into the game world because it sometimes happens that, for example, maybe you're playing uh, Pathfinder or some other role-playing game and you see many illustrations a bit more on the comic book side of things or in other role-playing games a bit more on the anime manga side of things and if you want to uh, tell those stories, that's great but if you wanted to play those games so that it feels a bit more realistic um, I think you'll have to put a bit more effort in imagining the different characters, uh, taking uh, your perception of them away from that, let's say, cartoon or comic book-like image. But when it comes to these photo manipulations, uh, you have an easier time visualizing the world as, uh, as something that is actually real. So it does a lot for the fiction in this role-playing game. Something that I really like of the Ambrosia Manual is that it's perfect for those that are just getting started with role-playing games. The manual starts with a great introduction to how you play role-playing games and the author Erlen van der Hagen talks about his inspiration, what motivated him to create Ambrosia. So if you have never played role-playing games before, it's going to be very easy for you to pick up this Ambrosia manual and start playing right away, understanding the flow of a particular session. And for the game master, there are many game master tips throughout the entire book. So this is excellent if you have, this is your first experience with a role-playing game more on the stories telling side of things, uh, this manual is the manual for you. You have uh, more details on the philosophy of the game on, or making it your own game 
and the different parts that the game master and the players, uh, how they participate. And then we jump into the setting. The setting of Ambrosia is an intriguing combination. It has a lot of echoes of real history and folklore and myth and legend. But at the same time, it adds those twists and turns, particular to the Ambrosia game world. It feels a bit like it tried, attempted to take the best parts of the Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones. So sometimes when the game world feels a bit too bleak, there are a lot of heroic details and things that focus completely on the journey. And other times when, when you feel like things are leaning a bit more towards that fantasy style, there is a sober, even raw or crude reality brought upon you that the good guys do not always win, that there is a lot of suffering and hardships, uh, that there is going to be a lot of difficult steps to take uh, during your journey in Ambrosia. It's also noteworthy that this Ambrosia manual is the complete manual. You could purchase this Ambrosia manual and you won't need anything else at all. It's not like those role-playing games that you have to buy three or four source books so that it feels complete, or those uh, other games that they tell you, oh, the game, is, the game world is so uh, big and expansive that we need to split this book in, in three separate books and they have like 40% the same content. And so it's not like that. So that's great. It shows a lot of, I guess, love and appreciation for the game world and for the players. So if you're one of those people that likes to get it like a complete role-playing game, this is the book for you because this is only going to be supported through Chronicles, that is adventure modules and such. So if you want to handle the game world, however you like the mysteries and the truths and half-truths presented in this game world, uh, you can do so however you like. But if you want to know what is the official version of what is going on and the different mm, details behind all of the mysteries of Ambrosia. This role-playing game will be supported uh, through the release of Chronicles. That is, they are kind of like adventure modules or stories that you can tell in the world of Ambrosia. But what they are giving you is the official version of the different mysteries and truths behind what is going on in the campaign world of Ambrosia. So this is great. They give you everything needed when it comes to the setting in this Ambrosia manual, but if you want to know exactly what happened according to the author's vision of the game, uh, you, could, you should consider getting those modules if you want to take that particular route. The setting of Ambrosia presents many dark and disturbing details of the Middle Ages. It's a society of injustice. There's a lot of disease, both of the mind and the body. There are some tyrannical conventions when it comes to the different uh, places in society. And what is expected of you to play as, uh, as a role in a particular kingdom. So things are not easy. And they show you the advantages and disadvantages of being, for example, a commoner or a noble or a member of the church. You have different creation myths as well. They conflict with each other. When it comes to the players or the characters, the player characters that you can create, the Ambrosia leans a bit more towards low fantasy. Most are human, uh, members of different uh, noble houses and the serfs and freemen, but you could also create dwarves and elves, but they are handled differently from other fantasy role-playing games. The dwarves are somewhat similar, but the elves have a very particular character to them, or strength of character. When it comes to creation myths, everybody's saying that they are right in what happened uh, with the formation of the world. So, for example, Druids uh, think that first there was nothing and there was a clash between the forces of order and chaos. The forces of chaos were represented by the beast and this beast fought against uh, deities of order and the beast was just too powerful. 
And from that clash, all of the creatures, the plants, the animals, elves, dwarves, humans, etc., came to be. The primal forces realized that they could never defeat the beast, so they basically banished the beast away, far away into another plane of existence. And they went away as well, so creation was left to its own devices. The elves hold a similar truth to this version of the creation myth, but they identify with the beast. The elves feel like they came out of the beast, and they consider the beast as something perhaps even divine. Uh, they came from the ripped off tip of the year of the beast. So elves follow their own uh, primal urges. They are a bit more like animals. In many places in the world of Ambrosia, the elves um, are treated somewhat like animals. They, they are given some, let's say, freedom as to what they do, because it could be like uh, seeing a wolf or a deer running in the forest. And when it comes to the uh, name of the world, it's known as Ment. But what this name means is very different from culture to culture, or uh, more specifically between the different fantasy races. Because, for example, the dwarves believe that actually Ment is the body of a dead god. That is, Ment, the anvil. And he got into a brawl with another deity who was known as Ragar the Hammer. And with every blow that Ragar the Hammer struck, a little piece of ment, the anvil, got chopped off. And that's how mountains were formed, and valleys, and seas, and rivers, men, elves, plants, etc. So, as you can see, there is a bit of a collision, a uh, conflict between the different uh, belief systems. And the one who's probably more dominating when it comes to a belief system is uh, that of the Church of Argonius. So much so that those that speak against this belief system are, could be persecuted, uh, captured, or even executed. And so there is a lot of conflict when it comes to uh, the world of men uh, because of religions. So, for example, according to the Church of Argonius, the beast was actually a mortal creature that was jealous of Argonius' creation. They consider Argonius to be a sort of like a god emperor. And this beast was interested in destroying the man, but Argonius eventually defeated the beast in a bloody battle, and he ended up sacrificing himself to protect his people. And this is a very summarized version. I'm just giving you a very few details of the entire story. They go deeper into the entire background. Uh, you won't have a shortage of ideas when it comes to the lore of the game and, and different chronicles that you can tell because of the perfectly detailed story. They even talk about people who used mysterious and forbidden magics to the point that they were consumed by that corruption and they attacked the rest of the world. And only Argonius uh, was able to unite the people and fight against uh, these, um, let's say, sorcerers that were consumed by, your, by their own magics. And in the world of Ambrosia, there is magic. Even the Church of Argonius uses magic, although they call it uh, sort of like miracles. So uh, there is a sense of wielding the supernatural powers around you, but it comes at a price. And we'll talk about that later on when I um, approach the system of Ambrosia. The history of the Cartesian Empire, that is the empire uh, dominated by the Church of Argonius, is filled with conflicts to the point that there is actually a second coming of the beast and only Argonius and his champions, his paladins, stood against this beast. They went up a mountain and they fought against this terrifying force of destruction and Argonius has to sacrifice himself to protect men. It is unknown, it is very mysterious exactly what happened with Argonius. Some say that he actually triumphed against the beast some say that he was a deity that actually trapped the beast in a plane of his own creation. But the thing is that he disappeared. And those paladins, those champions that followed him to battle, they became the founders of the present noble houses. In the lore of Ambrosia, there are many things that are not clear. And this is intentional. The Church of Argonius finds the truth somewhat inconvenient and does its best to censor or silence 
those that present uh, those inconvenient questions or uh, propose some truth behind the matter, they could actually be executed if they go against the, the will of the Church of Argonius. And so you get a sense that a lot of the members of the Church of Argonius are not interested in uh, guiding the people, but rather getting them into a certain ideology of what actually happened. After the disappearance of Argonius, things were somewhat mm, chaotic and or, or unbalanced. Things are especially muddy or mysterious when it comes to Evigor. That is, the noble house of Evigor, which was founded by one of the champions of uh, Argonius, fell from grace. It is said that the founder committed some terrible thing and he was banished. He feels a bit like a demon. He was sent into some sort of underworld or lower plane, although witches still uh, try to contact Evigor. So, the Church of Argonius considers Argonius to be a god emperor and anything else uh, to be perhaps corrupt or either subservient to Argonius. So for example, it is said that the Archangels once had Eritus, the founder of House Evigor. He caused strife and conflict, so even Argonius himself made an appearance and he actually cast Evigor into the abyss because of his evil ways. But still, there are others that would say that there is more to this story. I guess we can only find out through the Chronicles of Ambrosia. Or if you want to homebrew your own version of what happened, there is a lot of material here to play around with that mystery. The Alborlands had no ruler after the disappearance of Argonius. But something happened. There was this shepherd boy, and he received a divine message. This young shepherd by the name of Pyrrhic received a message from Argonius ordering him to restore his fragmented empire to its former glory. So Pyrrhic started to gather followers until he eventually had quite a bit of an army. And he took the entire army through the Cartesian countryside and he eventually reached the capital. And the ruler at that time, uh, the, which is the Pontifex Marsilius XV, uh, he wanted to avoid a massacre, so he let Pyrrhic inside of the capital and he talked with Pyrrhic. And later on, it was declared that Pyrrhic was the new ruler with the Pontifex at his side. So from then on, Pyrrhic would be known as Emperor Pius Aurelius I. And a new apparent golden age began in the Alberlands. Now, the Cartesian Empire only had a firm grip on the southern part of the continent. So it decided to annex the Alberlands next to it. However, many on the, in the Alberlands did not want to be, become a part of the Cartesian Empire, so they had to force them. There were a few houses that resisted this or attempted to resist this notably House Alfstein. However, House Valigant betrayed House Alfstein at the last moment. So then the Alberlands fell and they became part of the Cartesian Empire. So now the rule of Argonius or the Church of Argonius was supreme through the entire Alberlands. The Empire of Cartesia was in complete power. In this Ambrosia Manual, you get a clear definition of the social classes. You see the difficulties, the privileges, and perhaps advantages and disadvantages that each social class has. The noble houses, on one hand, they have to protect the commoners, but many of them also rule over them as slaves. And there is a lot of intrigue. All of the nobles are constantly looking to get the upper hand, to gain more power and influence. So sometimes they do not worry about the land and the people, although there are a few nobles that actually, or noblemen and women, that actually care about the people and the land, but they are few. When it comes to the lowest social classes, you have the serfs. The serfs are the poorest people in the land. They are, are considered property of the nobles. 
they are forbidden from hunting, so they have very little access to meat. At most, they can only eat pigeon and rat meat, so they are somewhat uh, malnourished. And they have to work the land as well. On one hand, they are protected by the noblemen, or they are supposed to be protected by them. But on the other hand, they are exposed uh, to disease, to injustice. In fact, if a nobleman commits some wrong to a serf, they have to fight a duel, but the nobleman is dressed completely in full armor with the best weapons available. And the serf is only able to fight with the clothes that he has on and a stick. So there are predictable results in that, in that battle. And there are the freemen. Freemen are the third social class in the Alberlands. They do not belong to the noble houses. They are not property. But at the same time, because of that, they are not protected. They, they shouldn't be protected by the nobles because the freemen decided to go their own way. And they are built with a suspicion by the serfs as well, because uh, most of the time, uh, freemen are not like working the land and do not have that stability of staying in a single place. Freemen are usually traders, traveling minstrels, uh, mercenaries, academics, and they try to get by by practicing their trade and taking advantage of different opportunities, profitable opportunities. As I was saying, the elves are not considered to be even human, more like animals, so they can actually hunt in those woods that belong to the nobility, and they will not be punished for that, because it would be like punishing a wild animal when it is only doing what nature intended. And the dwarves have a, work, a sort of working relationship with the empire. In fact, only the dwarves in the world of Ambrosia are able to enchant uh, weapons and jewelry and armor. They have the, those secrets of magic. And the clerics of Argonius, they are the unofficial fourth social class. They have a lot of privileges, especially since the annexation of the region. They control almost everything. Sometimes they could even have more power than the nobility. They have a provost in each part of importance that is basically the voice of the emperor. So the Holy Empire has different bailiffs and messengers and delegates and such, watchers, dignitaries, wardens, that make sure that everyone is following the teachings of the Church of Argonius. In this Ambrosia manual, they give you a lot of details, a lot of general information of what happens on the Alverlands. Because, for example, the vast majority of the Alverlandic population is illiterate, and this includes nobles and members from the clergy. And this is somewhat convenient for the priests of Argonius because they have the writ, which is basically the sacred scriptures of the teachings of Argonius. So if no one else knows what is written there or how to interpret the signs and symbols and such, they can uh, handle the truth however they like. They can also mm, stop communication from one place to another through written letters. So it's uh, an advantage uh, to keep the population in the Alberlands for those that want to dominate people, uh, to stop uh, people from reading and writing. And when it comes to metal, metal is somewhat rare. So for example, for the serfs and the freemen, it's very difficult for them to get their hands on some good metal weapons. They have to rely on wooden um, implements that's why the bow and arrow is kind of like the uh, weapon of excellence of the commoner. So those weapons that are made out of iron, they belong to the nobility. And those weapons of steel, they are truly rare. Only the dwarves know the secrets of steel. So as you can see, it's not easy to get the right weapons and gear that you want, especially because there aren't like specialized stores and stands. They need to barter and look for different uh, freemen and perhaps uh, dwarven merchants that are handling the different tools and weapons and goods that you want to get. So I think this also will pose a challenge as you go adventuring through the different uh, places in the Alberlands. You will need to take advantage of those offers or those when it comes to availability of the tools of the trade because maybe you you stop at that particular store and they sell weapons, but they're very high price. 
and you cannot afford to miss that opportunity, perhaps maybe you will decide, well, I, I'll keep going with my um, cudgel or my quarter staff, and maybe I will find a better offer when it comes to that short sword or that armor that looks half decent. But what if you never see it again in weeks or perhaps months? So that's something to consider. And this is when talking about, of course, uh, serfs and freemen, because no, and the nobility will have a better access to that. And of course, they have other things to worry about as well, because in courtly intrigue, everything can be used against you, against your reputation. And as I go into the system of this Ambrosia manual, you will see that social combat is even just as dangerous as physical combat, or perhaps even more. So it's not easy to find what you need in the everyday life. You also have information on what happens with, for example, the widows, when a man dies, how the widow has to continue his work, his trade, how serfs need to have uh, sometimes a lot of children. Um, a lot of those uh, children will not survive. It's not easy. There is not a good quality of life. Uh, you can also see the different uh, privileges because, for example, when it comes to children, they do not eat at the table with their elders. It's only when they become older, when they get that privilege. And also when it comes to alcoholic beverages, the older you get, the less watered down the beverage is going to be. You also have the, the information on the judicial system that is somewhat of a joke at times, as I was telling you. Most of the time, they do not want to carry out justice. They just want like a scapegoat or to solve things quickly, usually through some harsh punishment, like a hanging or chopping off hands and fingers. Mm, there are also uh, trials by combat. This is quite common, as I was telling you, but uh, if you are someone from a lower uh, social class trying to carry out a dispute against someone uh, above you, it's going to be practically impossible to win a trial com by combat because of the weapons that they give you during that trial. As I was saying, the serf is armed with a stick and no armor, and the noble is fully equipped with uh, plate armor and the best uh, metal weapons. So it's quite difficult. When the conflict happens between people of the same social standing, then a duel is carried out. If a woman is having a dispute against another man, it is normal for her to choose a champion, a man that will fight for her. And because these duels are usually to the death, it's also because the honor of an entire bloodline or family is at stake. So nobles are supposed to be trained from very little to be skilled in all sorts of ways of combat. And it is seen with uh, dishonor and shame if you are a man and you choose some other man to fight in your name. It is not forbidden, but it's, it's somewhat shameful. You also have more details on the Church of Argonius. They have a system of virtues and sins. Their virtues are based on the paladins of Argonius. Those brave individuals that stood alongside him when he fought against the beast. So those paladins which were Garald, Elora, Giselle, Ambrose, Vogomil, uh, Velin and Erod. They were those that were next to him and they are the founders of the different uh, noble lines. Although, as I was saying uh, before, Erod, which is of House Evigor, fell out of grace. So, because they helped found the Cartesian Empire, the read is usually based around their deeds and what they represent. And when it comes to the different sins, there are six of them. They are greed, heresy, pride, selfishness, sloth, and wrath. And this has a very powerful impact in gameplay. This is a way to remind the player characters that they are actually participating in, the, in a fictional world that tries to emulate a harsh reality as much as possible. When it comes to the different founders of the noble bloodlines, you have Saint Ambrose, who is the patron saint of priests and monks. And so uh, he represents hope and change. If you want your, to have your faith changed, he is the one uh, to use as a sort of like inspiration. He is the eternal counterpart of heresy. And then you have St. Bogomil. So he gives wisdom and pride is his enemy. You have St. Elora. And she is a patron of merchants, craftsmen and artists. 
and she opposes greed because she is also about uh, spending your money wisely. And then you have Saint Gerald, who is the saint patron of soldiers and warriors, and he opposes wrath, especially senseless wrath. He represents violence channeled in a positive way. You also have Saint Giselle, the patron saint of serfs and servants. Uh, serving is a great virtue, so uh, she opposes sloth. And then you have Saint Velin, and this is the patron saint of hunters, guides, and farmers. And he embodies everything that is not selfishness. And as I was saying, even though Erod was one of the apostles, he is now similar to a demon, to a being or creature of the depths of the abyss. You also have information on the hierarchy of the church. When you become a member of the church, everything belongs to a church. Everything that you own is now part of the Church of Argonius. So you have the different uh, titles and hierarchy, the uh, uh, cardinals and bishops. You also have information on the militant side of the church and how it enforces its uh, system of domination. You have everything that you need to know about the priests, about the duties carried out, what is expected of, for example, altar boys and children, and what is expected of the different monastic orders, and how to move within that hierarchy. You have information on the monasteries, on the lives of the monks or the nuns. It's mostly uh, patriarchy. Um, females uh, can be uh, an abbess, for example, or a nun, but uh, men are the one uh, taking the decisions. You have different orders following the teachings of the different saints. You have the Ambrosian order, the Bogomilian order, the Alorian order, etc. You also have a lot of information of the different beers of the Alberland, so that's great. Beer is delicious. <laughs> taken in moderation, of course. So the church produces a lot of beer. So you have the different types of beer, like bolt beer, the crown ale, how each type is brewed, stored, and distributed. You also have information on what the church considers heathens. So the church wants everyone to uh, worship Argonius. They know that the witches uh, decide to side with Eritus Evigor, the fallen archangel. So the church considers witches enemies. And they also consider those that speak against the church as enemies. Those that want to remain a bit on the sidelines, they are potentially left alone unless the church uh, finds them sinful in some way or another. So we have information about that. The druids it could also represent a bit of a threat for the church, but most likely because uh, of the belief system that they have. Not that the druids are constantly acting against them, but there is that potential enmity. Because the druids, in a certain way, believe in, in the beast, the church considers that they are, are supporting the enemy of Argonius. So you have different hierarchical systems of the druids as well, and more information on the witches. Druids work in a system of seasons. Each druid is ordained to a particular season that matches his or her personality. Their powers are also uh, dependent or rely on that specific season. So different times of the year, the druid's powers are going to be more reliable and other times less re reliable. Druids allow both uh, men and women uh, the same degree or the same standing in difference when compared to the Church of Argonius. Uh, but they give a lot of infor, uh, importance to people of older age. The greatest enemy of the Church of Argonius and any cult or religion in Ambrosia is basically the apostates, because they reject organized religion and cult. And because they do not join cults, they are more difficult to manipulate and to have control over them. So at times they may be even more dangerous than, for example, witches that they already have like pinpointed or categorized. So there is a lot of opportunity for adventures and conflicts when it comes to different belief systems and religions in Ambrosia. You also have information on the Hanseatic League. This is a very interesting league because this basically is a source of hope for some free trade. Usually the noblemen a particular house, the House Lombarden, 
had complete control over the trade of, in the Everlands. They controlled the prices and what is allowed to be uh, bartered or sold. But the Hanseatic League are basically merchants joining together and toppling down the control of House Lombarden. So they carry out battles in a different battlefield, in a battlefield of logistics concerning marketplaces, trade posts, and also social combat as well. So the conflict between the Hanseatic League and House Lombarden can play a significant part in any chronicle that you want to tell. You also have information on knighthood. There are two orders of knights in Ambrosia. You have the Knights Paladin. These are the protectors of the realms and the people. They are there to fight injustice. Their belongings and their very being belong to the order of the Knights Paladin. And they uphold everything that is good and true. However, they have a rivalry and a bit of a stigma with the Knights Templar. In the past, when the Cartesian Empire was annexing the Elberlands, the Knights Paladin came into contact with the Knights Templar. So even though both are protectors, they serve the land in different ways. The Knights Paladin are more focused on fighting that which is considered evil or unlawful in the Empire. And the Knights Templar, although they could carry out that action, they are mostly there to protect the church. So the Knights Templar have a reputation of being the poor knights because they give every material belonging of them to the church. Even though, for example, when the Knights Paladin, a member of the nobility, joins the order, once he leaves the order, he regains everything that he's given to the Knights Paladin order and they still retain their noble title. The Knights Templar ask you to be, give yourself entirely to the church. They take an oath of absolute loyalty to the church, although they are expected to fight anything that the church considers sinful. So you would think that the order of the paladins and the Knights Templar would sometimes, uh, or most of the time, band together against different threats. But for example, if the Knights Paladin considers something to be evil, but the Knights Templar are not given the permission by the church to act, then they will not act together. They may actually oppose each other, but that would spell uh, quite a bit of conflict. Remember, Ambrosia is a world of realistic consequences, both in the short and the long term of the game world. You also have more information on the nobility of the different titles, uh, how the oldest son will succeed the father, the type of role women in, no in noble women are expected to serve or carry out in their lives at court, and how bastards are treated, most of the time ignored, and then we have information of each of the noble houses. First, we have House Ulfstein. This house feels somewhat druidic because before the Church of Argonius arrived, druidism was the belief system. So House Ulfstein was a great promoter of this. They had the holy land for druids and were always trying to uh, have peaceful relationship uh, with the Alps, and they also were the problem, problem solvers or dispute settlers between the different noble houses. So they were sort of like diplomats, and they were the ones who opposed the Cartesian Empire when the Emperor Pius Aurelius marched into the Alberlands, but they were defeated, mostly because of the betrayal of House Baligant, and this is part of the mystery of Ambrosia. Why did House Baligant betray House Alstin? So even though Halfs Alstein still exists, because they are not in good terms with the church, sometimes they have to carry out covert operations and they have to exist almost like on the fringe. Some say that they are still posing some sort of resistance against the Cartesian Empire. And all of the information of the different noble houses is quite uh, complete. You have information, for example, the uh, coat of arms and uh, the type of duties that they carried out, uh, who they get along with, uh, how they serve the church, or how they oppose the church, and such. And then you have House Valigant. House Valigant is the mightiest military faction in the Alberlands. This is a noble house of warriors. And, as I was saying, they betrayed House Alstin during that particular conflict against the Cartesian Empire. And it's historically an enemy of House Tarnier because many years ago, Baron Victor Tarnier 
kidnap the wife of Duke Gerard, sorry, Gerhard Valigant forcibly to molest her. And this happened in 1121, after Argonius. Um, the Count of Marenvant at that time was able to diplomatically prevent war between the two houses. But there is more to this. The other house, that is House Turnier, has a different version of what actually happened, and we will get to that in a bit. Officially, House Valigant doesn't oppose the Holy Cartesian Empire, but it's well known that uh, they are not thrilled with the Carthesians' interference. Then we have House Lombarden, and this is a house of merchants. This is a from rags to riches story. They were refugees, and they had to struggle quite a bit to find their place. But once they established their noble house, and they started to carry out different dealings, they became the wealthiest noble house in all of the Arborlands. They're always looking for that strategic place to raise establishments and prosper in all sorts of ways. Then you have House Markov. This is one very mysterious house. Not the most mysterious, but one of the most mysterious, because this is all about magic and alchemy. They have a huge magical community. They already hide a lot of knowledge, more knowledge than the five alchemists' towers combined. So it is common for many members of House Markov to have many alchemists and wizards and sorcerers, and they have to be really careful because the Church of Argonius is constantly looking out for these types of talented individuals to hunt them down. They have the excuse of what happened in the past, as I was saying, in the history of Ambrosia, when all of those uh, spellcasters accidentally became corrupted by the forces that they wielded. So they are wary that it could have actually happen again. They are also adamant in trying to create a difference between the divine miracles of the Church of Argonius and magic. Most would consider it to be the same thing, but if they actually do that, it would be considered heresy. So here you have all the information of how they move in different schools of magic and how they use that mysterious force to their advantage. Then you have House Tarnier. House Tarnier is all about love, beauty, piety. They are a very artistic house. And as I said, they have that enmity with the House of Belligant because of that centuries-old feud. Now, their version of the conflict is that Baron Victor Tarnier fell in love with the wife of Duke Gerard uh, Valigant in that year, but in 1121. So, but she was actually forced into a loveless wedding with the Duke. Gerard was actually quite cruel and aggressive, and she abused the lovely Duchess. So Victor wasn't able to stand by and stole her away. So he didn't like kidnap her. Uh, he rescued her. But this is according to House Tarnier. So it's up to you to find out the real truth of what actually happened, if you want to homebrew your own version of what happened, or if you want to follow the chronicles of Ambrosia. And then we have House Valspain. Now this is a very intriguing house. This is a house of inbreds. They live near the swamps, and because of their inbreeding, they are constantly born with different genetic and mental defects. Some of them, for example, on the outside, maybe they have all sorts of uh, flaws, maybe they become really old really fast, or maybe they have deformities, or they maybe they are born without certain things, or later on in life they lose things. Or mentally, they um, present all sorts of uh, gen degeneracy or mental illness. So I think it's going to be very interesting to roleplay as a member of this House of Spain. And they're also famous because of their necromantic circles and rites and traditions. They are the ones who usually create sraals. These are basically undead servants, and they actually sell these servants. So this is a house with many mysteries and things to unlock if you actually survive contacting a member of House Valspain. Now, all of these noble houses are amazing. I, I'm surprised with the amount of information they give you. I have to uh, make a little pause to mention that. And remember, this is just on the human side. You can still create dwarves and elves. But if you decide to create a party of only humans, each one could, belong, could be a member of the different uh, noble houses. That's really exciting. You have more information on the world beyond the Alberlands. Because many of these places in Ambrosia 
could feel reminiscent of real world cultures because you have the holy Cartesian empire that is all of the information concerning it of how they are divided by two languages because for example in northern Carthesia they speak Arbetan which is uh, quite elegant and in the south people are more fluent on the exotic Cabran their languages are somewhat similar but they have been influenced uh, by different uh, cultural exchanges and then you have information for example of what lies south of Carthesia like Atras and Al Raba which is basically a cooperative between two caliphates the two northernmost territories in the Nevada desert and then you have information on Norheim and this lies across the northern bay in uh, the frigid north so people here are considered to be savage barbarians and they are very hardy uh, because of their inhospitable environment and rough climate but they're constantly carrying out raids and pillaging stealing raping and murdering people and some claim that they coexist with giants and trolls and then we have the moon idols now these islands are shrouded in mystery it is said that the Alps were originated here but how exactly that happened no one knows and what happened in the mysterious history of the Alps only the Alps know so the boatmen who sailed close to the moon isles speak of all sorts of inexplicable things all sorts of phenomena strange lights and the frightening house of monstrous creatures you have the Marvic mountains the realm of Galef Moria this is all about the dwarves that they work deep within the mountains and they consider to be uh, slothful or not working to be a sin that's the worst thing that a dwarf can, can be just being idle not, not doing anything you also have beyond the Morvic mountains an expensive area known as the wilderland the wilderland was corrupted by the dark eldritch powers of those old wars where sorcerers became corrupted by their own power so all sorts of supernatural things perhaps even worse than the moon isles inhabit this place it is considered almost suicidal to go into this place they say that trolls dragons and giants are here and in the east we have the exotic kunhai this has a great wall that protected it from all sorts of threats people here have almond shaped eyes and they have bronze skin and it is historically ruled by an emperor now what I like of the different people uh, detailed in this section is that you could have adventures featuring any of those cultures perhaps something that they say about them are true perhaps some others are false because for example what if you decide to actually go into the moon isles and you discover that it is not actually that magical maybe there is something else or maybe it's a different type of magic or maybe you decide to brave the wilderland and you find some secrets within it maybe something related to the noble houses and that's why they created all those rumors that there were great dangers inside it. there maybe there is some sort of treasure or document that gives you some important information about some of the conflicts or alliances between the different noble houses and of course any of these people can be used as antagonists the Cartesian Empire itself uh, is still quite uh, conflictive you have different interests and people uh, looking for power and having the upper hand over the other people so uh, you can use all of this background information in any way that you wish and then you have information on the elves or the Katari as they call themselves they are quite shamanistic if you were to compare them with human druids they worship the animal aspect of the beast while the druids are more on the plant side of things so the elves are born with a totem it is not uncommon for an elf to receive the name of a particular animal or insect even an insect and this totem represents their soul the elves are mysterious and chaotic they do not follow human laws or rules and those elves that are particularly joined to their totem can even wield some surprising magical powers or supernatural abilities so you have information on different mysteries of the elves on the relationship with their totems mostly and how they interact with humans 
and dwarves. Then we have dwarves that, as I was saying, they live in Morbic Mountains and they are the best craftsmen or crafts dwarves. <laughs> Their craftsmanship is so superior that they look at other types of products and objects with a bit of mm, contempt. That may get them into diplomatic trouble with other people. But the objects that they produce, especially their enchanted objects, are indisputable. They are the best of the best. And because they hold the, the secret of creating steel, or forging steel, that's also part of what makes the dwarves difficult to get along with, but still necessary. They are efficient in everything that they do. They value honor above all else, especially honoring what they do. They are divided in different castes according to their trade and they take insults very seriously. So things more of a symbolic value take great weight upon a dwarf. You even have dwarves that when they suffer some sort of disgrace, they have to shave off their beard, a symbol to show that they are looking for some sort of redemption that is usually only attained when they fight some great evil. So for example, like the creatures of the Wilderland. So they remind me a bit of the Slayers of Warhammer, but just a bit, because this is specifically geared towards the threats of the Wilderland. And so we're saying dwarves, even though they are capable warriors, they are still um, more focused on what they create. You also have information, for example, uh, on the lives and their times, on the great catastrophes that they suffered in the past because they were not industrious enough. In fact, dwarves, they do not normally sleep. They remain awake all the time. There's only a particular time in the year where they actually sleep for about a month. But the rest of the time, they are always working and working and working. So when the rest of the party is going to sleep, the dwarves are probably creating something out of wood or metal or anything. So it's going to be really useful when the party decides to rest to have the dwarf working on something that they will need in their adventures. And you also have information on the fate of Galeb Siglia, and this is a bit of a tragedy because this was a very important site for the dwarves. All of the ways into it have been blocked. The elves blame it on the dwarves. They said that once the dwarves were pretty much taking advantage of all of the resources in the land, they even created golems and they started to devastate woods and destroying the environment around them. So some sort of magical catastrophe was triggered and all of the entrances into this special site of the dwarves, that is Galev Siglia, all of the entrances were blocked. Then we have information on the planes of existence. Now this is heresy here in Ambrosia. The Church of Argonius does not want people to think of other realities and other sources of power. So this can actually get you killed you also have information on esoteric magic, such as Ecomancy, the art to shape living matter. You also have Hemomancy, the art to read and manipulate blood. Morphomancy, the art to shape lifeless objects. Necromancy, the art to manipulate dead and the undead matter. You have Pseudomancy, the art to copy or steal certain traits, abilities or skills from someone else. You also have Shadowmancy, the art to mold and manipulate the shadows. And Thermomancy, the art to manipulate weather and temperature. There is a naked form of esoteric magic, which is chronomancy, but this is a source of myth and legend. Magic users usually only specialize in one school of magic because they say that if you study more than one school, you will become corrupted like the sorcerers of the past. You also have information on the five towers of magic. If you want to have a sort of like a bleak Harry Potter scenario, you could Play it using one of these uh, Towers of Magic. You have the Tower of Stellem, the Tower of Druon, uh, Lagvelde, Morhaven, and Grafduin. Each one of them have different uh, disadvantages and advantages. Some feel a bit more resourceful and privileged than the others. And some others have a bit of an underdog type of story. So uh, keep, it, keep that in mind when you choose a particular tower to study at. Because in Ambrosia, in Ment, the social classes are not as important when it comes to magical talent. If a serf displays a great talent to wield the forces of creation and destruction, there's a good chance they will be taken as disciples by one of the mages, of course most of the time for a price. You also have information on the Cartesian calendar, 
uh, different Alberlandic myths and legends, different seasons. And there's a good variety of the different myths and legends, different themes and flavors. You have, for example, the stories about the hero Alric, which is all about heroism and underdog type of situations. You have the story of the Devil's Blight. And this legend concerns a dragon that was terrorizing an area. And so the paladins of Argonius, uh, they built this great fortress, this magical fortress, to keep watch over it. And they say that dragon is still around there, just waiting for that uh, watchful eye over the fortress to close so they can attack again. And then you have legends of the forest lord of Marenband, a mysterious creature that could be benign if you are not trying to do so, uh, something bad to the forest, or it could be quite nightmarish if you're actually seeking to harm the forest lord or his home. You have the widow of Fremont. That is a story of a very greedy woman learning about uh, humility and the true necessities of life in a very fatal way. You have the story of the girl in the waves, a cautionary tale of vanity and the changes brought upon you uh, through old age. We also have the story of King Plinius. This is a story of a monstrous being coming to an agreement with an unlikely hero. And the agreement is mutually beneficial. Then we have information on the Antargon. The writ predicts the end of times, when a series of calamities and phenomena come to be. Only those that are faithful to Argonius will find some sort of salvation, but the rest will be devoured by the hellish netherworld. Now let's talk about the system, the core rules of Ambrosia. Ambrosia leans more towards the storytelling side of things, but there are still some very interesting tactical aspects when it comes to combat in all its forms, that is, physical combat, but also social combat. To play Ambrosia, you're going to need a 10-sided die. And that's basically it. You're going to, at least when it comes to a core system, you're going to be rolling that dice. And that's how you will be successful in different checks. Just roll your die, add a modifier or subtract it, and that's your result. The characters in Ambrosia have primary abilities, which are physical, mental, and social. And from these three, you get secondary abilities. For example, physical divides itself in strength and dexterity. Mental divides itself in knowledge and intuition, and social in charisma and appearance. So depending on the type of check that you're going to do, you're going to be adding modifiers based on these secondary abilities. You also have a list of benchmarks, so you can determine when a ability is average, or when, when it's actually remarkable, or even divine. Ambrosia is not high fantasy. It feels high fantasy at times, but most of the time it's low fantasy. You won't be able to create gods and demigods in this game. You have ordinary people that could be quite remarkable and extraordinary in certain abilities, in certain checks, but for the most part, if you excel at a certain area, you're not going to be as good at that in other areas that are on the opposite side of things. So a character that is completely focused, for example, in uh, physical combat using weapons and such, may not be as useful in a social type of environment and vice versa. You could have some balances, but that's not exactly the norm. So checks are carried out, as I was telling you, rolling a die adding a number and you try to roll above a certain number. To reach that number or above means that you are entirely successful in that endeavor. But when you fail, something doesn't go your way to a great detriment. It depends on the situation. So for example, let's say a check is intuition nine. This means that you need to roll your die, add your modifier based on intuition, and you need to roll nine or above to be successful. You also have a list, a little table, on how the Game Master can apply different difficulties to different tasks. Some tasks perhaps are just feasible, like chopping a log in two with a single strike. It's a difficulty of nine. But some checks could be difficult. 
So for example, maybe you're holding up a very heavy particulars. It could be a difficulty 14, a strength based. Or maybe something is nearly impossible, like for example, listening on in a conversation on the other side of a noisy marketplace. You also have information on the post checks, which is basically that each player rolls a die, adds the appropriate modifier and the highest roll wins, or ties. You also have information how to have teamwork, like unified strength checks. Maybe you're trying to lift something very heavy with more players or characters. Um, you make a roll and you add the secondary abilities of those that are helping. A rule of one is a failure, always a failure. It's always unlucky. But a rule of 10 is exploding dice. If you roll a 10, you roll again. And if you roll a 10, you roll again. And that's part of the legendary aspect of Ambrosia, something that makes it a bit more epic. Sometimes even a lonely surf can do something quite remarkable. It could be the will of the gods. It could be his own willpower. Nonetheless, this exploding dice mechanic adds to that, giving you a chance to be incredibly successful at certain things. However, this doesn't apply in damage. You do not get explosive dice when, for example, you're attacking with a small knife. It, it, you're not going to be able to, for example, break rock or a solid metal door with your knife. So this adds a bit more realism to the game. And of course, depending on the situation, on general bonuses or combat bonuses or magic bonuses when you are carrying out a spell, you can get penalties or bonuses, of course. There is extra effort in this game, and this is a very useful and tactical mechanic. Your primary ability can be spent to give you a better chance at accomplishing something. So for example, maybe you, uh, you're going to make a check and you rolled one or two points below that. You could spend points of your primary ability to reach that number. You can also use karma points, which are gained through the adventures that you are having. Karma points are not refreshed. So once you gain them, you must treasure them because primary abilities do regenerate when you go to rest but uh, karma is a very valuable resource. If you rolled really low, you may consider to use your extra effort to re-roll that dice. Uh, however, uh, keep it in mind that once you get that second result, it stays like that. Or maybe you can use extra effort again, it's all up to you. And I think this is a great way to have a bit more control over the fate of your character. Ambrosia, the world of Ment, is very greedy and unforgiving. So you're going to be thinking when it's actually necessary to spend extra effort or karma. In Ambrosia, death does not always occur unless you are in a very dangerous situation. But for example, if you're committing some sort of uh, trespassing action or crime, you will usually get punished in some way through mutilation or perhaps through shame. So it is recommended that the game master does not punish the player all the time when he's attempting something. Maybe you're playing a sort of like a rogue and you try to steal something from someone and they catch you. They are going to cut off perhaps your hand or maybe some sort of other disfigurement. Or maybe uh, that rogue was actually a very famous adventurer and now he has um, sort of like a stigma to his reputation. So that could be another way of handling it. So Ambrosia is more focused on telling interesting stories of overcoming odds and dealing with what uh, happens to you in life. You also have details on carrying capacity and encumbrance. When it comes to the things that you're keeping, for example, in your backpack, it's not so strict as long as you're not saying something like, I'm going to carry that huge iron or uh, throne inside my backpack or something uh, that's obviously not logical or allowed, unless maybe there's magic involved. But for the most part, if you're carrying like, oh, I'm going to carry this statuette and this bag of coins, uh, there is no problem. But when it comes to your weapons and armor, then you have to take a look at your strength, uh, plus 10, that's your carrying capacity. If you carry more than that, you're going to get penalties to different checks. Now, when it comes to actions and action points, for example, in a combat round, you have a limited number of things that you can do in a single round. Each round feels quite personal. Every player character has an initiative value and you act based on that value uh, in order. 
but because every action costs a number of points, there is a certain combat economy to keep in mind at all times. Maybe you go first, and maybe you decide to attack Vera with a very heavy weapon, and you say, oh, it takes a lot of points, maybe it takes like five or six points to do that, but what if that doesn't give you a chance to react when you actually, actually need to react? Maybe your weapon is really heavy, and you can attack with it, but you cannot parry. So you have to keep that in mind. Sometimes it's it could be more useful to carry a lighter weapon if you're going to be doing several things at once. But some things are also quite inexpensive, like shouting a short sentence. Or for example, if you try to evade a blow instead of parrying, um, that's only four points for action points. And of your 10 points, that means you will still get a chance to do other things. So you have to be become aware of what your enemies and your allies are going to be doing because maybe you already acted spending a number of points and later on someone else takes his turn and he attacks you and now you do not have points enough to evade or parry or even if you wanted like to shout a warning to someone so you have the values of the encumbrance that also has to do with for example you want to buckle on a shield or draw a weapon you have different points based on that uh, particular encumbrance you also have some more mm, non-combat related actions, maybe you want to jump on or over something or open or close a door although all of that has to do with combat, it is encouraged that in Ambrosia the player characters carry out creative abilities, maybe you want to drop something, a heavy object over someone or if you want to swing from a chandelier or jump on a table to get a bonus when you're attacking all of that is encouraged or maybe there is uh, something in the ground, maybe there are hot, hot coals and you want to kick them at your opponent and you could do that, or a bucket of whatever, uh, so that the floor becomes slippery, and maybe there's water or grease, and you want to uh, place that uh, penalty or disadvantage over your opponent, you should carry out those actions, because a good game master will reward those actions. You also have information on other actions like flying and swimming, and how to uh, have underwater actions as well, because in water it's a bit more difficult to move, of course. And when it comes to combat itself, it's very gritty and definitive uh, in both the physical and social combat. Mental damage can also be suffered due to psychological and magical effects that impact you. But overall combat damage is extremely harmful and we will get to that in a few minutes. When it comes to ranged weapons, you also have uh, limited range or benchmarks as to how far you can shoot your weapon and because of that, you can have a penalty. So it's better to attack at the optimal range. Now let's talk about traumas, the damage that you take uh, during combat. Let's say that you're having a fight, a physical fight, and you have this set of circles as you can see in this image light trauma, severe trauma, incurable trauma, and critical trauma. Most light wounds will end up hurting you in light trauma, giving you a minus one penalty. And penalties in this chart are cumulative. That is, if you have a light trauma and then a severe trauma, you're going to have minus three to all of your checks. So combat becomes a downward spiral quite quickly. The wounds will pile up. So let's say somebody attacks you with a small weapon and deals you 5 points of damage, of trauma. You're only going to mark that 5th cir circle in the circles of light trauma. But if someone attacks you with that weapon again, and it deals again 5 points of damage, you will have to mark the next circle under severe trauma. So that's how damage is being accumulated. And if you get attacked again, it's going to go to incurable trauma and such. When you get to severe trauma, you have to make a check, otherwise your character could pass out from the pain. And if you have several light traumas, maybe you were attacked with a weapon that dealt 3 light trauma damage, and 8 light trauma damage, that means now you will have a minus 2 in light trauma as a penalty, because those are 2 light trauma wounds. And of course this increases the chance of that becoming severe trauma. So if you're constantly getting to combat carelessly, your character is not going to live long. You have to be really careful with this. When the damage reaches incurable trauma, it's usually when they chop off something from your body. 
or they cause some brain damage and it has the expected effects on you of course and critical trauma this is uh, quite close to you uh, dying so in ambrosia you're going to end up dead if you are careless when it comes to mental as well incurable trauma usually happens in a psychological illness or disease type of way if you let's say you suffered a head injury now you cannot feel, uh, think as well as before and when it comes to social drama this is a bit more it has to do more with the story but it usually tarnishes or dirties your reputation even if uh, the evidence used against you or anything is true or not so all forms of combat in Abrosia are devastating if you are not intelligent and think of your character's actions some of the physical incurable traumas could be maybe you got your left eye gouged out and now you have a combat penalty and intuition as well penalty or maybe somebody chops off your left leg well now imagine now you need a, a peg leg or something because you're going to have a, a penalty to your action points and, and your dexterity as well when it comes to incurable mental traumas you could have amnesia or a short fuse an addiction or psychosis and this is a great way for the game master to play around with your perception of the adventures some things could be only things that your um, crazy character suffers when it comes to incurable social dramas as i was telling you maybe your actions have hurt a small community and now you're not very popular there and you're dealt a number of points of social damage but maybe your actions affect an entire region so now you're going to be perhaps hunted down by several groups when you suffer incurable or even critical trauma your character usually passes out that is in combat you cannot keep going because of the pain and you get knocked out uh, when or maybe you're bleeding out of course in mental situations your brain probably shuts down and you pass out and in social situations those like uh, dramas where a courtesan faints from a scandal that could also happen so you have to be really careful with those types of traumas there should be uh, no return if you take for example massive damage that beyond the circles of this uh, critical trauma that could also kill you so do not think that you'll be able to jump in lava and become unscathed or, <laughs> or step under the foot of some giant monster you're going to be die immediately Unarmed combat in Ambrosia is handled in a somewhat uh, primitive way. That is, do not expect um, very specialized martial arts that target different uh, vulnerable areas of the body. This is more like um, mm, meat and potatoes, not much thought given fisticuffs, that you deal some combat damage that usually results in someone getting knocked unconscious. So even though it's quite possible, for example, in real life, there have been cases when someone kills another one from a very strong blow to the head. In unarmed combat in Ambrosia, it is not expected for characters to usually undertake that kind of training. And it's more on a knockout situation sort of way. When it comes to healing, it's not as easy. With a single night's rest, even for dwarves, they are not resting. They rest by working. Uh, they recover their light wounds, their light traumas. And a character can spend three points of a primary ability to convert a severe trauma, for example, uh, into the corresponding light trauma type of circle. But other more grave wounds will probably require the care of a surgeon or a barber or magical aid. So keep that in mind as you are adventuring. This is not a game where you easily recover from everything. In addition to that, every time you rest, you roll a 10-sided die and you replenish a number of primary ability points equal to that result. So that's what I was saying about that karma is quite precious because you cannot recover it like primary abilities that have an opportunity to refresh, uh, significantly so, with each night of rest. You also have to worry about your soul. In Ambrosia, there is a constant battle for the souls of the living both human and elves and dwarves have their souls at stake so your character is constantly committing acts of selfishness gluttony pride sloth wrath and impiety your soul score will go down usually an adult has a soul value of seven 
Unless you have committed some terrible act or if you are actually quite saintly, you could start with a higher or lower soul score. But for the most part, you're going to be taking soul damage if you are constantly committing selfishness, gluttony, pride, sloth, wrath, impiety. So this keeps, um, to put it in a way, murder hobos in check. And once a character loses all of his soul, he becomes a non-player character, an antagonist. Probably the most mm, cunning and malign antagonist if the Game Master wants to play it like that because he knows everything about the group. If his comrades stay within the, let's say, positive side of the soul chart, they will still be able to, to participate in, in the adventure, but those that lose their souls now become uh, bitter, resentful, angry, hateful, and they will do everything in their power to bring destruction to the world around them. And then you have details on disease and poison. You have things such as toad's scurvy, which is a skin disease very common among poor people in the Everlands. Or you have the gaze, a disease that affects the eyes with blindness. There are many things such as the pox, blood cough, St. Giselle's fire. Some of the diseases are magical, for example, lycanthropy. Uh, some of them are quite uh, common and terrible in real life, like the Black Death. So, you could have an, an entire adventure trying to stop uh, any of these diseases. Because, for example, I was researching the other day about the Black Death, because I, I always knew a bit about but here they give you a lot of details and I got curious. And it horrified me how it traveled from uh, fleas, carried this terrifying bacteria uh, from the east, and only cats could actually eliminate the rodents that had these fleas. So, uh, for example, in real world, when the Inquisition ordered the killing of all cats, all of these rodents managed to get into different cities and spread the Black Death. Quite terrible. Maybe the player characters want to stop. There is sort of like a plot in this world of Ambrosia to uh, propagate the Black Death. And you also have details on life after death. So what happens when your character dies? It is recommended that the Game Master becomes creative. And maybe undead will start to sprout when there is a lot of, of death going on. And it will be very interesting to see how the different creation myths and paradise and let's say hell from the different belief systems in Ambrosia uh, clash together or even mesh together at times. Another important thing when it comes to uh, death in Ambrosia is that even if your character dies, you can create a new character and you do not feel too behind the other players. There is a scale of power. You, your characters do become a bit more powerful and effective as they level up, but you never feel like there is a huge gap. When, for example, when comparing it with Dungeons and Dragons, maybe all the characters are in level 15 and 18, and if you create a level character, that, uh, sorry, a character that is in level one, there is a huge gap. But here in Ambrosia, even a uh, starting character has a chance to match up and even overcome uh, the accomplishments of his uh, friends. And then we have uh, the golden rule information on how you can take any of these rules mechanics in Ambrosia or even the theme, the, anything that you like about the story or you dislike about it, anything that you do not like of the rules or do you want to explore further, uh, Ambrosia encourages you to modify and tweak everything about it to remove it and add some other things, etc. as long as the group is having fun and you're having a rich experience. Now let's talk about character creation. The character that you create in Ambrosia is not just a playing piece that you can use to navigate the game world. A character in Ambrosia feels a lot more like a set of clothes that you inhabit to experience the game world. Each of these characters that you can create has his or her own uniqueness. That character has family, has friends and enemies, experiences joy and sadness. There is absolutely no disconnection between the characters that you create and the chronicles that you tell in Ambrosia. All of the chronicles have to do with your character's background and future. It all feels magnificently tailored to tell a story with real implications despite being a fictional world. To create a character, first you decide the base characteristics, 
Maybe you belong to the House Alfstein or House Valigant or Markov for Tarnier, or maybe your character is a free man or a serf or a dwarf or an elf. So you have different physical, mental and social values. Let's say that you decide to create a character from House Alfstein. They are pretty good at physical endeavors, so they have a physical value of two. They are not the smartest, of course, they have a mental value of one. But because of their diplomatic nature, they have a social value of three. This is somewhat different, for example, if you decide to create a character from um, House Tarnier. They are not very good at physical or intellectual endeavors, but they are quite familiar in how to move in the different noble circles and convincing others and persuading others even if they are of different social classes. Or for example, House Valigant is quite uh, militant, so they have a really high physical value. Or House Markov, that is quite magically inclined, they have a really high mental value, but they are not very social and not very skilled in other physical endeavors. A human free men are the most balanced because of their constant journeys and uh, travels to sell their wares and perfect their different crafts and arts. They are very good at physical tasks, mental tasks, social tasks. Uh, a human serf is very good at socializing and they are also very hardy, but they are not very intelligent. This is because they do not have a very good education, but they are very good at uh, forming sort of like alliances and brotherhood with other serfs. And... Um, be physical because they are constantly working in the fields, they are usually quite strong and dexterous. And then when it comes to dwarves, they are very strong and uh, quite intelligent because they are craftsmen, but they are not uh, very amicable. Elves are not very amicable either, but they are a, a bit smarter than dwarves and also quite physical. These elves, when compared to other fantasy games, they feel more like wild or wood elves. So this has to do with your descent with the blood of your character that de determines the values of the primary abilities and secondary abilities as well. And then you pick a flaw for your character and you subtract uh, one point from the corresponding primary ability. So it's a physical flaw, you're going to take a point from physical uh, ability and if you decide to take two flaws instead of one, which is the maximum number of flaws that you can take, your primary ability linked to that flaw is lowered again, but you get to pick an extra skill or talent. Now, based on your primary ability values, you will be able to choose uh, talents and skills. These are the modifiers, usually positive modifiers, that you will add to your D10 when making a check. And then each skill and talent is also linked to a secondary ability. You can determine this ability scores by counting the corresponding skill and talents. So for example, you have two skills or two, ta two talents that are dexterity based, then uh, your secondary ability of dexterity will be two. And maybe you have a skill or talent based on strength, then you have a, a value of one. So in total, uh, that would reflect your primary value of three. And you can use your starting money to buy equipment, basic equipment. And then you only have to fill some details like um, where you come from, uh, your name and title. And a lot of background information is recommended to be kept in secret. Maybe you belong to a noble house, but you don't want uh, the other members of the group to know to which house you belong. So there will be secrets, even amongst the uh, members of the party. This was cemented in the quick start that there were some secrets uh, one, uh, between some of the members of the group so uh, this shows the complexity the richness and the depth of ambrosia the character sheet is perfectly organized to take note of all of the values and abilities etc and let's take a look at some of the flaws because this will present exciting challenges when you are role playing your character you can have several physical flaws, like for example, that is uh, several physical flaws that you can choose from. You could be clumsy, so you get a general penalty uh, to your dexterity checks. 
or maybe you have martial incompetence so you're not very good at handling weapons and you each action costs an extra action point or maybe you have weak constitution so you have a general penalty when trying to resist poisons and diseases you could have some mental flaws maybe you are absent-minded so it costs one extra point to use extra effort maybe uh, you are uneducated so you have a general, general penalty when it comes to knowledge checks or maybe you are a savage so you have a general penalty when outside of natural environments then you have social flaws maybe you have an aversion against a certain group of people so you have a general penalty for charisma checks against members of that people maybe you follow a code of conduct so you cannot break this code if you do you lose soul or maybe you have a negative aura so animals get a general bonus when fighting against you so overall you can see that these flaws are quite flexible and not as let's say as plain as you would expect from a physical or mental or social flaw there are many ways to work this into the background of your character now let me give you a few more details about skills and talents let's say that you have a um, social primary ability of four so this would mean that you could take four skills or talents talents can only be taken when you create your character they're kind of like gifts that you would, were born with unlike other role-playing games that you can develop a talent here you are born with that talent and that's it but you can develop skills you can learn from your travels and journeys so let's say maybe your character has a social value of four you could take some talents or skills uh, around charisma and appearance perhaps two talents that have to do with charisma and two talents or two skills that have to do with appearance so that way you have a four of total because your social value is four you cannot have more than four talents or skills now you may remember that when you take two flaws you can take an extra talent or skill and this is no problem at all you add that extra talent and skill and you add one to that primary um, ability value so that it, uh, there is a sort of balance it sounds a bit complicated but it's actually really simple i'm not doing a, a the best job at explaining that but that's actually it that you can only take a number of skills and talents equal to your primary ability you have all the information how to organize uh, all of those skills and especially when it comes to weapons and how to write in your character sheet the type of weapon the damage that it deals the penalties related to different uh, traumas etc now let's talk about some of these skills and talents when it comes to physical talents uh, related to strength maybe you are burly so you have a general bonus uh, for strength checks and when it comes to skills in strength maybe you have armor skill so your armor skill is increased uh, by a number of points for every piece of armor you that you wear or maybe you have rage so you spend a uh, one point of your primary ability to gain a combat bonus or a general strength bonus when it comes to physical talents in dexterity maybe you are ambidextrous so you're going to have an easier time when wielding two weapons at once when it comes to physical skills in dexterity maybe you have acrobatics so you have a bonus when climbing tumbling jumping etc or maybe you're really good at uh, picking locks or maybe you specialize at using ranged weapons so you have a bonus when doing that and when it comes to mental talents maybe you are educated and you have a bonus in knowledge or maybe you have a magical aptitude and you have a magic bonus with using esoteric magic maybe you are knowledgeable in alchemy so you can identify alchemical concussions and it is said that dwarves had the secret of alchemy and um, humans managed to get some of those secrets but when it comes to arcany which is the domain of the dwarves only a dwarf character can use this uh, that dwarf character can identify arcane constructs there are also other things like herbalism linguistics and when it comes to mental talents uh, linked to intuition maybe you have an animal companion maybe you have a strong mind so you reduce uh, damage taken when, for example when casting spells and when it comes to intuition skills you are really skilled at finding and removing traps 
or maybe you are really good at judging the character of someone, so you have a bonus when trying to figure out someone's motivation. Or maybe you have affinity when it comes to the subterranean environment, so you have a general bonus in confined space, escapes, catacombs, etc. This is only uh, for the dwarves. In charisma, in social talents, maybe you have a companion, a loyal comrade that adds to the party, that is, this is a non-player character that goes with you on journeys and such. Social skills tied to charisma. Maybe you are a down-to-earth type of person, so you have a bonus when dealing with the lower social classes. Or maybe you have really good etiquette, so you have a bonus when dealing with the higher social classes. Maybe you are really good negotiating. Some social talents linked to appearance could be natural beauty, so you have a bonus to appearance checks. Or maybe you actually have a divine touch, so you have a general bonus when using heretic skills uh, related to the magic of Argonius. Oh, sorry, that's not magic, that's, oh, those are miracles. <laughs> and then you have uh, social skills linked to appearance, such as camouflage, you have a bonus when hiding. Elegance, uh, you have a combat bonus when wearing armor. And then you have seduce, a bonus when seducing, etc. And there's a lot, a lot of background related information on the different skills and talents, so that you do not feel that it's something that's just there to give you an advantage in different situations. It has to do with the background of your character, but also you have the relevant information concerning and how you can use this in, in rules terms. When fleshing out your character, you also have a list of names, uh, depending on the culture, on where you are a human or an elf or a dwarf, and depending on your social class, you have the typical Alberlandic names. Some of them are based on lineage, some others are based on your trade. Uh, a lot of them have a lot of meaning to them, especially, for example, dwarven names. They're usually tied to your particular caste, uh, where you are a member, of, for example, of the nobility, of dwarven nobility, or if you are more on the blacksmith side of things, or, the, or maybe you are selling something. This has to do with uh, your name and tie, tying it to your profession. So there are names like, for example, Derbia. It, it means uh, the locksmith caste. Or maybe you are called Ergin, which would be kind of like Master of the Feast. Or maybe your name is Krimdir, which would be Grand Keeper and such. Elven names are quite natural. They're usually tied to the names of their totems. So it's quite common to see an elf with the name of um, Hare or Bird or Wasp. It could be any sort of natural name like that. You have an entire chapter dedicated to equipment, to the values, and that is um, how much each piece of gear costs in copper, brass, silver, and gold, which is handled at cor as corte, brass pennings, uh, shillings, and florin. So you have um, the amount that you receive based on your social value to get your starting gear, and how you can gain uh, more riches when bartering is not enough. You have all of the different monetary values of weapons, and there are many weapons, meat cleavers, daggers, sling, shot bows, long sword, throwing axe, warhammer, anything that you will expect. And you also have armor and shield. Now, armor in this game works as damage reduction. So it doesn't give you a bonus to avoid being hit by a weapon or that a weapon makes contact with the entirety of your body. It reduces damage, but shields, they make it a bit harder for you to get hit, so they do not offer reduction, they just make it more the check to hit you more difficult. And then you have clothing and some tips on how to gear up your character without having to spend um, every minute uh, buying the shoes and the shirt and grips. They, they give you like a way to make the process faster. You also have different substances, plants, herbs, utensils, tools, anything that you can think of in a medieval setting, you have the price for it right on the list, of course, right here. You also have some really um, unusual concussions. Some of them are toxins that you can apply to your weapons. Some others are just a simple herbal teas. Some other are oils. You have lavender tea, healing potions, magic salve, even a truth serum. You also have information on things that you can buy for your spells and rituals, like a spell book. You, you also have the price on how much tuition at a Tower of Magic costs. 
You also have arcane enchantments, usually offered by the dwarves, as they could enchant you in your ring or your armor or weapons. You also have the costs of services, uh, in drinks and rooms and food. And remember, because the world of, of Ambrosia tries to emulate uh, like medieval times, sometimes you won't be able to afford the most luxurious and um, pleasurable accommodations. Sometimes you have to pay a lot for a simple room with perhaps a piece of bread and you'll have to settle for that depending on the place that you are using uh, to travel. Another thing that is important to note is that you can play as any sort of character in this game as I was telling you. Even if you want to play a duke, you can do that. However, you have to keep in mind your, of the implications that your travels will have because you could say, well, I'm a duke that travels all over the place with his army. That would bring suspicion. Maybe someone would, like, would accuse you that you are trying to invade a neighboring area. Or maybe somebody will take advantage that you took your army out of your castle and they will try to take over your castle. Or maybe they will start to spread gossip about how you are quite unusual and do not follow the standard procedures. And your social values will go down. You will take severe social damage and maybe you will not be able to even function properly in the game anymore. You also have the cost of different animals. You even have a glossary if you are not familiar with different objects and weapons and gear. Because, for example, there's the garden dag. And this is basically a wooden pole, about 1 to 1.5 meters long. So this is the typical pole uh, with a metal ring and pike on top. And so this is to punch riders of their horses and stab them when they're down. Or maybe you do not know what a hurdy-gurdy is. It's a violin-like instrument. It's bow replaced by a wheel that's turned with a lever. The instrument is played by pressing keys, shortening the strings as they are pushed. So this is great, especially for someone uh, who is not very familiar with the terms of this particular uh, time that Ambrosia tries to emulate. Then we have a chapter detailing everything about magic. Magic in Ambrosia is subtle, uh, creative, and dangerous. Every time you cast spells, you can suffer mental damage. And it is encouraged that the spells in Ambrosia are used creatively. The spells and rituals are not the typical, uh, you shoot this bolt of energy and you deal this number of points of damage. There are spells similar to that, but they encourage the player character to use the spells in all sorts of creative ways, not just in combat, any sort of way that they can think of. An important rule of thumb is that it's impossible to be subjected to the same spell or ritual at the same time. So, for example, if several magic users cast the same spell as, at a single target, you have to carry out a knowledge versus knowledge check to determine which one is effective. So, no spamming spells in this game. Spells usually have a more immediate result. Usually, you chant some words and make some gestures and something happens. But rituals uh, usually take hours and perhaps several participants and even sacrifices in the darkest magics to carry out those effects. So, you have a clear definition on the difference between alchemists, that they create uh, concussions and substances, but arcanists uh, can enchant objects that are usually on the magic weapons, uh, magic armor side of things. It is the secret of the dwarves. You also have esoteric magic. So echomancers uh, can mold living matter. They could, for example, heal wounds, but also create uh, grotesque things out of flesh. You also have the hemomancers. So they are able to unlock people's secrets by reading their blood, and they can even purify toxins and diseases. You, they could even use someone's lifeblood against him or herself. You also have the morphomancers that are able to control and warp lifeless, lifeless matter. So they could create some magical artifacts. They are quite limited when compared to the dwarves, but they specialize. If they specialize in, for example, in repairing or animating everyday objects, they can succeed quite well. Then we have necromancers, of course, they are specialized in the realm of death and undeath, so they can create undead servants, and they can manipulate other sorts of morbid energies. Then we have pseudomancers, and they are not taken very seriously by the other magic casters because they emulate other effects, but because of that, the pseudomancers are quite flexible. They would consider themselves superior, even. Then we have the shadowmancers. Shadowmancers control the shadows, and they are masters of darkness with the ability to remain unseen and even use shadows against their enemies. Then we have the thermomancers. They are able to manipulate heat and cold. They could even be quite useful if you want to resist the power of the elements. 
And the eighth school of chronomancy is a mystery. It is not detailed here, but a game master could come up with his own homebrew version of chronomancy. And then we have details on hieratic magic, on the magic that the druids, witches, monks, and priests use, and shamans as well. All of the spells have a target, a duration, and the check that you need to do, and the execution, how the spell happens, and the description. So maybe you have things such as regenerate, by mending and gapping wounds, or deform, which would be to render someone hideous. You also have things such as shape shift. You also have read blood. A lot of them are quite self-explanatory. You have effects of, of a telekinesis type of thing. You also have ways to distort matter and Im imbue things with life to cause fear. I develop a sort of spirit sight to see spirits of the dead and controlling them. Everything related to the magical disciplines that I mentioned. You also have auras that are exclusive of more clerical or priestly type of characters. So for example, those that are the priests of Argonius, they have the aura of Argonius. And they're going to get a bonus, for example, against followers of Argonius. This is a way to keep followers in check. That is, the priests of Argonius always have an advantage against those... Sorry, oh, yeah, well, yeah, uh, over those that follow the church of Argonius. And they also have bonus against, for example, devils. But this applies in a similar way to, for example, druids. They have that attunement with the beast, so they have a bonus against followers of the beast over their congregation. So this is a way of the different priests to exert control and domination over their followers. And this applies to, again to witches, that they also have bonus against the, those that follow Eritus or Edigor. And witches also have a way to bless others through lay on hands. This is probably the first role-playing game that I have seen, that there is a witch character with lay on hands, which is usually the exclusive for the paladin. You also have information on the rituals that I was telling you. They have extraordinary effects, somewhat similar at times to spells, but more on the long term and sometimes to a devastating effect. So for example, we have arrow toxin. So this is uh, basically a way to imbue an arrow with a permanent toxin until it is used. You also have other things such as, for example, uh, climate change. This ritual allows a thermomancer to change the weather in a large area. Other rituals include Devil's Mist. So this is a volatile potion that is created in this uh, ceremony. And when opened, it generates an immense amount of smoke. So this is great to blind enemies and to make sneaking around a lot more feasible. You also have uh, other potions like Dragon's Breath. So it's filled with a volatile gas that explodes as soon as it comes into contact with oxygen. So it's sort of like an alchemical grenade. And then you have other rituals, so for example, mass concealment, which allows a shadow mancer to extract a specific area from the attention of whoever would observe it. You want to hide like a, a small village? You could do that using the mass concealment. Or if you... Uh, want to carry out a purification ritual that is also possible to rid someone from infections and toxins. I think these rituals are great excuses. They also have some more conventional things like summon spirits ritual, summon devil, transmutation, um, truth serum. These rituals, as I was saying, they are great excuses for some combat encounters. Maybe you want to stop someone from completing a ritual or maybe you're the caster of the group is trying to complete a ritual and you have to protect that character or attack that character so that the ritual is carried out or not carried out. You also have information on the wild magic zones, a random table so that you do not feel too safe when casting spells in certain areas that are supposedly blessed or cursed. And then you have an entire chapter detailing monsters. Monsters in Ambrosia have a very strong root in European folklore. A lot of them are, are quite scary, but others you could only you could just encounter them and nothing bad happened perhaps even gain some information from them so you have information on all of the races and all of the monsters that you can find in the alberlands some of them are really tough a level 7 monster just take a look at this look at all of the levels that you can take of damage when you usually can only take at most four levels of damage normally 
So do not expect to fight a dragon and have an easier time doing it. You also have information on how to have companions, uh, how to have them assist you in battle. Maybe you will actually become uh, friends with some of the beings that you can encounter in Ambrosia. Most of them could be human, but I, I think it will also be uh, interesting to have an adventure when you become ally of some unusual creature. And all of these monsters have different skills, such as an acute sense of hearing or smell. Maybe they breathe fire. Maybe they have a flaming aura. Maybe they have some sort of hypnotism ability. Maybe they take pain quite well. Or maybe they are really tiny or they have stone claws. And you have all the information and how it applies in game terms when it comes to these special uh, monster skills. You have information on the Ardmen, which are dark beings from the Wilderland who live exclusively underground. So you have different types of them, like the Ardman Runner and the Digger, Warrior and Night Dancer. There are many varieties, and that means you can have different adventures around a particular monster or use a particular class of that monster to suit the needs of a chronicle. There are some beasts and monsters that are quite bizarre, like the Shield Spider. Some classic ones like basilisks, griffins. You also have some others that are common, natural and perhaps expected, such as eagles, uh, foxes, lynxes, pigs, rabbits. There are constructs, different types of golems, of homunculi, gargoyles. You also have devils, such as the advaras the Necker and Succubi. You even have Fallen Angels and Archdevils. You also have dragons like the Lindworm and the Tree Drake, the Sea Dragon and Fire Drake. You also have more types of dwarves. Maybe you find a dwarf alchemist or a smith and you can negotiate with those dwarves. You also have dwarven shield maidens. You also have uh, ectothermic type of creatures, just the mermaids, the bishop fishes, the uh, lizard men, tritons. You also have different types of elves, such as an elf scavenger. You have elves linked to different totems, such as the elf linked to a fish totem or the insect totem. And you have a huge list of humans. Any trade imaginable. This is so useful for a game master when the player characters are going into a city or town. They could find alchemists or assassins or bards or maybe a member from um, House Valspain or they could find beggars and bishops and cardinals. So if you want to engage them in social or physical combat, uh, you could do that or having a sort of interaction, a bit more peaceful interaction. And you could also um, get a great idea of how they are going to interact with player characters based on their intelligence and their um, social values or charisma, etc. Of course, you also have spirits. Maybe there is a will o wisp that is trying to lead you astray towards uh, your doom. Maybe you find a werewolf or a nymph. There are also trolls and giants, kobolds and stone trolls, ogres. Even Nephilim, there are fire giants, there are also different types of undead, zombies, skeletons, shrals, poltergeists, vampires, and at the end of the book you have an excellent index. I really wish they add hyperlinks later on because this index is perfect to navigate the entire book, but as it stands right now it's not as easy to use it in, in a PDF format. So what do I think of the Ambrosia Manual? This game is really sophisticated and very exciting. I think it's important to note that if you are looking for a game along the lines of going into a dungeon, killing monsters and obtaining powerful weapons and artifacts and riches, this is not the best game for that. You could have that experience but you would be wasting all of the rich background of Ambrosia. This game has so much to offer. It's more along the lines of Aros Magica 
and the old World of Darkness games. This puts great emphasis in storytelling, but at the same time, it offers that tactical depth in combat. The way that the wounds keep piling in, it's a perfect way to represent, at least when it comes to a storytelling type of game, to represent when you get too many cuts and you start to bleed out, or maybe somebody's attacking you with a warhammer and suddenly you already have a few cracked ribs and it takes a toll on you. So there is a tactical aspect in combat and the way that it also encourages you to be creative in your actions, not just I hit you with my sword and you hit me, I hit you with your, my sword. They encourage you to describe your actions, to have some tactical maneuvers around your enemy. That will give you an advantage. If the game master is playing Ambrosia as it should be played, he is going to give you the advantage as long as you play it smart and tactical. And social combat, even though physical combat could be the end of your character, in the worst case scenario, social combat can also be devastating to the point that you can no longer exist in society because you have been labeled as a coward or as a traitor or as an ignorant or a fool. All of that can destroy you completely and take you completely outside of the society in Ambrosia. Not even the Serbs will want anything to do with you. So there are different dangers, many challenges that your character needs to overcome. But at the same time, that also means that you can obtain great glory. Even as a capable fighter or as a person of great uh, lordly caliber, if you are a noble or a serf that works hard and is very loyal, it's not going to be easy considering all of the dangers and underhanded maneuvers of the different social classes. Even as a freeman, you could also find yourself in some sticky situations. But if you manage to overcome all of that, you can go far in the world of Ambrosia. However, this is a, a still a dark fantasy game. There are many scenarios that will go against the characters. You will see your plans toppling down and you will have to adapt. There is so much richness in the different noble houses, in the militant orders of the church, the Knights Paladin and the Templars, when it comes to the background of the dwarves and the elves, the clashing of the different belief systems. This is a very rich role-playing experience. And when it comes to the monsters, even though they could seem standard in fantasy games, when you first encounter them, they have the, their own folkloric flavor and abilities. So kobolds in this game are very different from the kobolds that, that they attack in tropes with their small, small spears and daggers and short swords. Here they feel a lot more supernatural, something that is whispered in myth and legend and suddenly you find it before you. Here, people not only have to worry about the machinations of nobles or the irrational uh, behavior of ignorant serfs or the conmen type of maneuvers of the freemen or the machinations of the church or the druids or the witches. Dangers can come from many different sides, but that also means that you can triumph in any of those situations. You can attain mastery over the supernatural forces you can become a noble with great prestige and titles. You can become a serf that lives and prospers, uh, perhaps even helping the community. You can also become a free man that perfects uh, his craftsmanship or art as he travels along and makes some, a living out of selling his products and purchasing other things. So there are many ways in which you can play Ambrosia. This is a great advantage in its favor. Because, for example, there are other great storytelling games, like, for example, Ars Magica, as I was saying, and I haven't played that, but they say Pendragon is also a very good game. But as you can see, in Ars Magica, you have to play as a wizard or one of his uh, cohorts or allies. And in Pendragon, you have to play as a religious knight. But here in Ambrosia, you can have all of that. Not to say that I don't enjoy Ars Magica, I... I like dipped my uh, my foot on it and I found it really amazing. I want to play it more. But if you don't want to play just wizards in Ambrosia, you can play as a knight, you can play as a mercenary, as a merchant. You can only be like a courtesan trying to manipulate the social circles of the nobility in your favor. You could be a spy, you could be a scout, you could be a witch or a priest. You can be anything Ambrosia is a jackal of, of all trades and you really cannot say master of none because this game can actually make things work 
You're never going to feel like, oh, it's going to handle things in a lukewarm sort of way. If you want to have an adventure, uh, maybe a company of knights that are going across different lands, uh, doing all sorts of good deeds, you could do that. And it would be quite a challenge, considering the bleakness and the underhandedness and corruption in some of the places in Ambrosia. The world of Ment offers so many opportunities to venture into it in any way that you like. You could have a party of adventurers specialized in social combat or physical combat or exploring the mysteries of mind and magic. Or you could try to have like a normal everyday life experience in Ambrosia, trying to handle some more mundane matters and just every now and then something supernatural comes along or happens or some great danger and you have to find your way to overcome or negotiate your path through that. So, my highest recommendation for Ambrosia. You really need to try this game out. But I do think that you need a certain sophistication when it comes to the game group. I can already see some players playing Ambrosia and they are not going to enjoy the richness and the depth of the game world if they think that this is an average role-playing game experience. This is a storytelling experience with a huge, a massive background in 270 pages of the Ambrosia Manual that the author wants you to explore. Erland van der Hagen wants you to get into each aspect of Ambrosia for the rest of your life. That is his intention. That is how I feel that he communicates it. Because this rulebook is so complete. And as I pointed out near the beginning of this review, this game is going to be supported through Chronicles. You will not need any other source books or additional material to feel like the complete Ambrosia experience, but you want to know exactly what is the official version of all of the truths and lies and mysteries of the world of Ment, then you could follow those Chronicles. So thank you so much for watching my review of Ambrosia. I do hope that you try the game out. If you have any comments or questions, please let me know. See you later.